Thanks again for joining us. We are up to episode 61 of Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study where we are trying. This is our moment where we think, okay, we're taking two steps closer to God. Understanding that daily uh, we struggle with sin and repent and, you know, there are occasional steps back. But this is our intentional time to try to continue to grow in our relationship with the Lord. So Sanctification is two steps forward, one step back. Yeah, it's often the, the believer's journey. So... We are up to Mark chapter 11, and we are getting now into actually Holy Week. So we're all the way up to, remember, Mark's gospel is the shortest of the gospels, which mm-hmm. means we get to um, the the end just the fastest, but that means we get to the Holy Week uh, famous stuff the fastest as well. So we're already up to Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Anything you want to mm-hmm. say before we get started? Let's do it to it. Let's do it. All right. Go ahead and read through your copy of Mark chapter 11 at home. Here is my personal paraphrase for the chapter. Jesus and his disciples were going toward Jerusalem. When they were at Bethany, Jesus sent two disciples ahead to untie uh, an unbroken colt. So a non-trained, non-broken colt uh, for him to ride. If anyone questioned it, they were simply to say, the Lord needs it. And that, Jesus says, was going to be sufficient. They did as Jesus told them, and some people did question it, and they responded accordingly, and there was no incident. When the colt was brought to Jesus, everyone threw their cloaks over it. Some spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread palm branches. And everyone shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and other similar types of praises. Jesus and the twelve twelve then went back to Bethany because it was late. The next day... Uh, So this would be the the Monday of Holy Week. Mm -hmm. They were headed back to the city. Jesus was hungry and sought figs from a nearby tree, but it was not the season for figs. And we're told he cursed the tree and that it would never bear fruit. And he does that so in front of his uh, disciples. When Jesus got to the temple into the temple courts, he drove out the money changers and those selling doves and other merchandise in the temple courts. He wanted the temple to be a house of spiritual renewal, a house of prayer for all the nations, not, um, you know, like this, just this economic center. And he makes, he quotes from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7 and referring to it as a den of robbers. The chief priests and the law teachers wanted to kill Jesus because the crowd absolutely loved him. But the disciples left the city at that point. The next morning they went by the fig tree, which Jesus had cursed. And the disciples noticed that the tree had withered. Jesus told them, that if they had faith, they could move mountains, and when they pray, they should forgive one another. Uh, The chief priests asked Jesus who gave him this type of authority, and Jesus responded by saying that he'd tell them how he got his authority if they told him where John the Baptist got his authority. Now, this is a little bit of a trick on Jesus' part, because the Jewish leaders knew that if they said, well, John the Baptist got his authority from heaven, people wouldn't question why they didn't listen to him, or people uh, would question why the the Jewish leaders didn't listen to him. But if they said that John the Baptist got his authority from humans, then people would riot because the people absolutely loved John the Baptist and recognized him as this great prophet from God. So what the Jewish leaders ended up saying is, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And that kind of quieted them and got them off Jesus' back. Jesus responded then by telling them that he wasn't going to reveal to them by whom or from whom he got his authority either. Mm -hmm. That's a paraphrase from Mark 11. Jesus is kind of a weird dude. Jesus is, he is. Why do you say that? Because he's just constantly talking and he doesn't make any sense most of the time. (laughs) Is it he that doesn't make sense or is it you that's not grasping his sense? Yeah. Uh, he's, but he's, my point is he's talking in parables. The disciples ask him many times, like, we don't understand what you're saying. He's oh. cursing fig trees. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yeah. Like, he just seems kind of weird sometimes. Yeah. That comes he up behaves in behaves a... differently, which I'm just calling weird. Right. Which you think if he is perfect and humanity has fallen. Mm-hmm. So I our, must be weird. Our perception of his behavior would... If he's really God, I would think it would be better and different mm-hmm. than what the way typically humans behave, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's part of the issue. He, like, he should be um, weird to humans. Mm-hmm. And for that matter, the problem with 
us Christians sometimes is that we're not weird enough. Mm -hmm. Like maybe we're weird for the wrong reasons, but <laughs> some are weird. Some of us are, yeah. Some of us are just odd for, for reasons not having, having nothing to do with holiness. Uh, it's just because we're odd in other ways, but the idea that we would be marked by the world as weird mm -hmm. because of our Christ likeness is really part of the goal of that's something to aim for, mm -hmm. uh, as Christians in this world. Um, but yeah, he's, he's definitely different, um, and necessarily different and good different. And, mm -hmm. um, but he's, there's something about him that is both incredibly attractive mm -hmm. and there's something about him that to everyone also is incredibly offensive. And that is the, the tension point with all of us who are sinners, who see the perfection of Jesus Christ is like, because our sin nature wants us to be the lords and saviors of our lives. So we don't, we, we re naturally reject that. There's mm -hmm. a hostility towards that. And yet at the same time, we recognize the trueness of it, the beauty of it, the goodness of him and so forth. And that's, that's compelling and attractive. Why is he cursing the fig tree? It's not doing anything wrong. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting account. Uh, I'm thinking, so it's not one of the three points that I had on here today. And it's one that comes up in the other gospels. Okay, and okay. I was going to bring it up then because sure. uh, it gives it, it gives us a little bit more detail mm -hmm. elsewhere in the longer gospels. But uh, yes, it is very, very odd. He seems to just get upset about a tree mm -hmm. that he knows is out of season that wouldn't be bearing fruit. It's to some extent, just short answer, to some extent, it's a little bit symbolic of this generation and this world mm -hmm. as it's not producing the way that it's supposed to. Gotcha. Um, okay, so three devotional thoughts for the day. Number one, the idea of a humble king. The story, the image that you should get on Palm Sunday is one of uh, a king, but a king unlike the kings of this world. So even though we do have Old Testament records of kings riding, for instance, on like a donkey, that generally is, has not been, even that was designed to be a, a, an understanding of a, like a humble king. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, if you, if you asked a kid to draw a picture of a king riding into his, you know, a conquering king riding mm -hmm. into his city, like it would probably, not that kids draw horses very it's well. It's like when Aladdin about, but, becomes Prince Ali and he comes in with his... It's majestic. Menagerie. Yeah, mm -hmm. the menagerie. That's a good word. Like this huge procession and like King Arthur riding in on his, mm -hmm. this white steed, you know, this huge, you know, stallion of a horse, not trotting in on a donkey. And it's like, what exactly is that? Like very clearly people are singing his praises, but he's coming in to not to go to a palace. He's coming in to go to a cross. And it's like, this weird um, dichotomy of images that you see on Palm Sunday, and that's the point. He is a king, but he's a humble king. He is clearly authoritative because, like, so every detail about this, how they go about procuring the, the cult, like, so there's going to be a guy in a city, and he's going to have a donkey there, mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to say, just take the donkey and just say, my master needs this, and mm -hmm. he's going to let you have it. Like, that... Okay, so how does he know it's there? And how does he know that the master's going to let mm -hmm. him have it? And how? And then don't forget the fact that that's... Well, Colt let you ride it, though? That's the thing. It's unbroken. Mm -hmm. And very clearly, like, part of the... Without pushing this too hard, the part of the metaphor of what's going on here is when Jesus gets into the saddle of creation, everything obeys the way it's supposed to. And, like, for you and me, when Jesus actually... When you allow him to get into the saddle of your life... Mm -hmm. um, he he's your master but he's not like a he's a gentle master mm -hmm. that even like a little cult why you know why wouldn't a cult let you just ride it because it's afraid and it's scared and it's prideful and it's like gonna gonna do its own thing mm -hmm. and but they were it it recognized the goodness of him mm -hmm. and he was gentle with it and yet it recognized that he's his master so that's what we really want what we really need is a gentle master not a master who will abuse us mm -hmm. and not to be the masters of our own lives but a gentle master and that's the humble king concept well sometimes i look at Gemma and i'm like man you like she definitely knows that you are her master uh -huh. but i'm like she has such an easy life like she wants for nothing someone provides all of her meals someone takes care of her health someone walks her and gives her everything that she needs all the time like that's like if if jesus actually is your master yeah he's not lording it over you or like ruling it over you he's just providing for you and taking care of you in the same way you would for her which is the problem problem that we have in 
I mean, especially as Americans, we have issues with like a king. Like we were, <laughs> a part of our founding is predicated on the idea, uh, the idea of, you know, taxation without representation mm -hmm. and like the idea of democracy is one of like really uh against the notion of a dictator type mm -hmm. of rule and so we generally really bristle at the idea of a king now we got to get comfortable with it as christians because we're going to live in a kingdom with a king for mm -hmm. all eternity but the problem we have with kings uh and the concept of that is not the king itself it's the fact that every king we've ever seen that has a sinful nature tends to rule for his own good not for the good of his people mm -hmm. in other words there's a selfishness that he's propping himself up on the backs of his people but what if you had a king that would lay his life down for his people uh, who benevolently lives for their good and their benefit ahead of his own you'd be happy to have a king like that you know mm -hmm. and that's the idea that's the picture of jesus he doesn't fit into the I mean, he's not, he's not King Herod. He's not wicked like that. And he's not, he's also a prophet. He's not wicked like the Pharisees and religious tyrants because religious people can be tyrannical too. Uh, he's a humble, gentle king. And that is all packed into the mm -hmm. concept of, you know, if you would simply let Jesus be in the saddle of your life, um, he's, he's not going to hurt you. He's only going to help you. Mm hmm Devotional thought number two, we see Jesus' fury at uh, the temple. This is a different side of Jesus. Sometimes the, sometimes he's depicted as uh, so like hippie Jesus concept. Mm -hmm. Like most of the, most people when they, you ask them to depict, you know, or, or imagine uh, a con conception of Jesus, they will think of one of the hippie pictures that they saw in the, 60s 70s something like that you know long haired almost kind of effeminate um mm -hmm. gentle like downcast uh, you know blue eyes soft skin disposition yeah 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 totally and like so much about that is probably wrong mm -hmm. uh but the idea that like he's weak or feeble or like gentle is one thing uh gentle doesn't mean you lack the capacity mm -hmm. to create disturbance it yeah. means that you uh lack the aggression but at times, there is such a thing as righteous anger and righteous aggression mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. And when Jesus sees his father's house and the temple being used to uh, take advantage of people as opposed to uh, serve people and mm -hmm. forgive people and, and that sort of thing, when it's, when it's being done to man's glory, not to God's glory, that he flips in a self-controlled way, but he flips the tables over because he's flipping out over this. Like mm -hmm. this is not supposed to be this way and somebody has to do about something something about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we miss that. Sometimes we miss that even in the church too. Is the idea that sometimes leaders, uh, sometimes Christians have to get righteously angry about stuff that is just not okay um, within the context of church. And, and that's hard to do because you're gonna, I mean, you, uh, we so position the conception of love as acceptance and tolerance of mm -hmm. everything that it almost doesn't allow for the the idea of righteous anger. And to such an extent that a lot of people have positioned Jesus in their minds as somebody who would never get this kind of angry. Mm -hmm. um, but he very clearly is right here, you know, and it's appropriate for us to have a righteous kind of fury or angry anger at times too. Devotional thought number three, uh, I'm going to call it thought provoking deflection. And it's part of Jesus methodology that comes up again and again in the gospels, particularly with the Pharisees and Sadducees who attempt to antagonize him. You'll notice that he often responds to questions with questions because their questions, Jewish leaders questions aren't general questions to try to learn something nearly as much as they're an interrogation. Like they're looking for evidence by mm -hmm. which they can convict him, try him, and execute him. Yeah. And so um, what Jesus does very often is he gets him off his back by kind of turning it around on him. Mm -hmm. And the situation here is he has, okay, the Jewish leaders questioning his authority. He's in amidst a crowd of people, of, of Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is this is Holy Week, the Passover week. There's a bunch of Jews there from all around. John the Baptist is this legendary figure uh, in Jewish society already at this point. And the Jewish leaders ask Jesus, okay, where are you getting the authority to do the type of things that you're doing? This is nonsense. This is blasphemy. This is 
And he says, okay, well, I'll answer your question as soon as you tell me where did John the Baptist get his authority? Because mm-hmm. he knew John the Baptist was at odds with the Jewish leaders too. And yet the, the people, the Jewish people loved John the Baptist. So the moment he pressed the Jewish leaders on that, if they reacted negatively towards John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ, the people are going to riot and overturn the system of Jewish leadership. And so the Jews read the room and they know that's the case. And so their answer is simply, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know where he got his authority. Okay, we'll leave you alone. And so they back off. And from a application standpoint, this is not a bad technique. Uh, when people are out to get you just from the standpoint of, um, you know, if it's the world, you know, from an apologetic standpoint, if people are trying to criticize this is stupid and this is stupid and this is stupid, sometimes the best way to offer defense is to use the brain that God has given you and say, okay, well, you are criticizing me about this. Well, what does this look like from your perspective? Mm-hmm. You know, like, so, I mean, a simple example would be like the idea of like, so the creation account. Mm-hmm. Somebody criticizes the idea that God would create the universe in six natural 24-hour days. Say, okay, well, tell me, why don't you tell me where uh, you think is a more plausible creation explanation? Mm -hmm. Um, Does the universe have a beginning? Yeah, okay, almost everybody believes that today. By the way, not everybody believed that until after the early part of the 20th century. And then, uh, so now now we, almost everybody universally accepts the universe has a beginning. Okay, well, what caused the universe? Well, it just it just kind of happened by energy. Okay, well, where did the energy come from? Where were the uh, what get? Where did the laws of physics that created a universe come from? Where did the initial material, like the right environment, where did that come from? Mm-hmm. Whatever your explanation to those things is, is almost by default and definition God. This is called Kalam's cosmological argument. Is the idea that everything that has a beginning has a cause. Um, And, you know, therefore, what is the ultimate cause Mm -hmm. um, of the universe? Like, that has to be God. So my my point is, when somebody's saying, well, that's not plausible, that the universe began, well, you tell me what you know about how the universe began, Mm -hmm. and let me see if I think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. You know? And by the way, they'll just start backing themselves up because they don't have answers to some of those questions. And then, you know, not too much later, they're not, they don't think that the idea of, six 24 hour days sounds that preposterous anymore, mm-hmm. you know, because they realize how little they actually know about it. Yeah. My point is there's lots of different arguments that you can make in those ways. And Christians have to be prepared to give the reasons for the hope that they have. And sometimes it's not going to be convincing somebody else of something, but if somebody's really attacking you, sometimes it's, uh, provides a little bit of a shield against some of those attacks. It's not going to change anybody's heart ultimately and win them for salvation but it might create space in which you can do ministry. Cool. Any final thoughts, Aid? Mm-mm. All right. Would you close us out with a, a prayer for Mark 11? I don't want to. You don't want I'm to today? S- no, I'm so tired. Please, no. <laughs> okay. I will gladly pray for us today. Heavenly Father, thank you again for an opportunity to study today as we look at Jesus, uh, our humble king, riding into Jerusalem, uh, help us to understand that balance. Uh, Lord, we don't need to be, we don't need to rule over this world. um, And we are also not helpless in this world. We are cheering you on as our humble king. Uh, That means that we know you're totally in control of the whole thing. And yet you're in control of the whole thing, not for your benefit, but for our benefit. And uh, we worship you in that. Thank you for being a king who doesn't lord things over us, but a lord who lays down his life for us. Uh, Help us to live our lives in such a way that honors you as that humble king. May it be to your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for studying with us. We'll see you tomorrow for Mark 12.